Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. I want to thank you again for joining us on the program again this week. I trust that you are being blessed by the Word of God that's flowing from this ministry. Uh, Once again, I just want to remind you that if you have missed any of the teachings that we've done, we're in a series right now where we're teaching from the book of Revelation. And if you missed any of those, you can go back to uh, YouTube and watch anything that we've aired to date is on our YouTube channel uh, that's on the web, the World Wide Web. You can get it anywhere in the world. Uh, so anywhere that you can get an internet connection. So you can go back and watch again uh, some of the stuff that we have done uh, on the book of Revelation to catch you up to date. I think this is somewhere in somewhere near 30-some programs that we've done. It's very difficult to unpack this in 30-minute segments, but uh, the response has been great, and we just continue to ask you to let us know uh, if you want us to continue on this teaching. If this is blessing you, let us know, because uh, we're going to decide uh, over uh, the summer months whether or not we're going to continue to teach this when we come back in and start uh, re-filming uh, for the fall season. So uh, your response is very valuable to us. Go to our web page and send us an email. Call the number on the screen. Go to our public profile page on Facebook, which is Lynn House Ministries, and uh, let us know that you're watching. Also, I would say to you, share this with your friends on Facebook. Go to YouTube and share it. Help us get the gospel out. I also would mention that if you have friends that are in foreign countries, our uh, our uh, closed captioning on our YouTube page will uh, translate into other languages all over the world so that if they cannot understand English, they can read the closed captioning and get the message uh, anywhere in, around the globe. So uh, tell your friends about us, share this, go to our page and share it, and uh, uh, we appreciate you doing it. It helps us get the gospel out. Uh, we're going to come back again because we're dealing with the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation, and I want to, I want to read from it again today to, and, and kind of unpack a little bit more. We've done probably, I think, four programs so far on this fourth chapter. We're probably going to do at least one more. But uh, I want to read our text. It says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and, and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes, before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had the face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, which was, is, and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lives forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were and are created. Now, I've shared so much about this over the last four weeks, uh, but this throne to me, again, is, uh, is a very powerful symbol of the kingdom of God. Its rainbow symbolizes the new covenant. I've already shared with you why I believe that. There's one sitting on the throne that's to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there's a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And we, we dealt with that rainbow, uh, that it was a picture and a symbol of a covenant. There's one seated here that's reigning and that's ruling. There's a, there's a message that's like the voice of a trumpet that's calling you up higher. It's calling to come up hither. Uh, we shared in the last segment that come up hither is more than just a geographical relocation, but it is a dimension in spirit that God is calling, I believe, His church to. As a matter of fact, this message is being released to the seven churches that were really in Asia. And uh, this chapter starts out by saying, after this. My response to that is, after what? 
Well, the answer to that question is after you repent and overcome. So what gives way or access to this throne, to this dominion, to this kingdom authority, to this authority of the believer, and we're going to talk about that more in this segment, is uh, simply changing the way you think, the paradigm shift from an old covenant mentality to a rainbow, a new covenant mentality, where God says, I will never be wroth or angry with you again, because this is like the waters of Noah to me. Uh, If you go back and watch some of the prior segments, I talked about the rainbow in Isaiah chapter 54, and what that, how that spoke to God as this is as the waters of Noah to me. I said, what was like the waters of Noah to you, Lord? And he said, Isaiah 53. So I went back and read Isaiah 53. He was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement for my peace was on him. Jesus is like this big ark that we all got in. He is our vehicle out of an old world dominated by sin and by the curse, but he's our vehicle into a new world where we land on a mountain called Ararat. Interestingly enough, the word Ararat means the curse is reversed. So we got in the thing. See, we didn't even escape the judgment. We got in Christ. We got in the ark called Christ when God poured out all of his judgment on him because in Isaiah 54, he said, for in my, and for a small moment, I've hid my, my face from you, but with tender mercies will I gather thee. The small moment where he hid his face was on Calvary when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the t- moment that God turned his back, but in the, in, with tender mercies will I gather you. And so everything about this to me is so powerfully redemptive. This rainbow is our covenant. It is our new covenant. It is what brings us into uh, this renewed mandate that God gave to his original man. I believe when uh, Adam come, not Adam, when Noah got off the boat in a new world, God renewed his mandate that he gave to Adam and simply said, this is the new world, have dominion, subdue the earth. In other words, you, you've got a right to live and reign here. Replenish it, fill the earth, uh, you know, uh, live lavishly, the, the, uh, the message Bible says. I, I want to give you the abundant life on every level. I believe that's still the call of God to believers in this hour is that God has not appointed us to wrath, but he's, a, he's appointed us to obtain salvation. That's powerful to me. But when I begin to go down through here and see that he's not only seated in a throne with a rainbow around about it, and like I said, we've already covered that, so I cannot take another whole segment to touch that. But verse 4 is where we're going to pick up, and around about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting. Number one, they're clothed in white raiment. Number two, they've got crowns on their heads. And out of the throne proceeds lightnings, thunders, voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits, or the sevenfold spirit of God, as I think portrayed in Isaiah the ninth chapter, talks about what the sevenfold spirit of God is. But what I'm simply after today is that there was four and twenty seats. Now, I think it's incredibly uh, powerful that a few verses, uh, the last few verses of chapter 3 of Revelation says, To him that overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me in my throne. Now, when I see people seated then in the fourth chapter on thrones, 24 of them, as a matter of fact, are seated on 24 seats. Round about the throne, there were four and 20 seats. Upon these seats were four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, with crowns on their heads. If you don't see this crowns on their heads, robes on them, as being a part of their, uh, their right to rule and reign with him, you're probably missing the point here. This is more than just a great, nice outfit where we all sit around in heaven one day and we've got nice outfits on. This, to me, speaks very powerfully. You know, in the book of First Chronicles, Chapter 24, uh, I, I, let me see if I can find that for you very quickly. First Chronicles, chapter 24. One thing that's nice about iPads is you can look it up real quick in these iPads. Uh, in First Chronicles 24, well, I said you can look it up very fast. Uh, 24, verse 1, it said, Now these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron, the sons of Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. But Nadab and Abihu died before their father and had no children. Therefore, Eleazar Ithamar executed the priest's office. And David distributed them, both Zadok and the sons of Eleazar, 
and Ahimelech of the sons of Ithamar, according to their offices and their service. And there were more chief men among the sons of Eliezer than of that of the sons of Ithamar. And thus were they divided among the sons of Eliezer. There were sixteen chief men of the house of their fathers, eight among the sons of Ithamar, according to the house of their fathers. Thus were they divided by lot, one sort with another. For the governors of the sanctuary and the governors of the house of God were the sons of Eliezer and the sons of Ithamar. So the, the governors or the, the governors of the house were the sons of these priests. And Shemaiah, the son of Nathaniel, the scribe, one of the Levites, wrote there before the king, and the princes, and Zadok the priest, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, before the chief of the fathers, the priests, and the Levites, one principal household being taken for Eliezer, and one for Ithamar. Now the first lot came forth to Jehoram, the second to Jedidiah, the third to Haram, the fourth to Sorom. And he goes on down through here, and it lists literally 24 courses of priesthood. Now, what I'm simply sharing with you is that the, the reason there's 24 seats, it was because David set up 24 courses of priesthood under his reign, which is a picture, you know, to me, the throne of David is a powerful pattern uh, of the greater son of David, who is now ruling and reigning, who is establishing uh, a kingdom of priests or kings and priests unto our God. The fact that they've got crowns on her, their heads to me tells me that they're kings. The fact that they, they are uh, sitting on 24 seats declares to me that they are priests. So can we kind of maybe draw this conclusion that this may be speaking of a people who are kings and priests who've got white robes on, and the white robes speak of the righteousness of the saints. So that I could simply say to you, this is the new covenant priesthood of the believer with the right to rule and reign in the earth, because in the book of Revelation, he said, he hath made them, next chapter or two, he will simply say this, he hath made them kings and priests unto our God, and they shall reign, not in heaven, but on the earth. We have a right to reign in the earth. With that being said, I want to take you also into the, the book of uh, uh, First Peter. Let me uh, go over to the book of First Peter, uh, chapter number two. First Peter, if you're taking notes today, the book of First Peter, chapter number two, and I want us to look at, uh, let's see, let's begin uh, in verse number nine. It says this, it says this in verse number nine, this is uh, Second Peter, or First Peter, I'm sorry, First Peter, chapter two, verse nine, it says, but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I submit to you that this scripture that Peter is talking about is actually being manifest in chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. It is a chosen generation. It is a royal priesthood. And what you see happening in Revelation is what they were called to do, to show forth the praises of Him who hath called us out of darkness and into His marvelous light. I believe that's the reason they're throwing the crowns at His feet, saying, you alone are worthy. You're the King of kings, and you are the Lord of lords. And we bow in reverence and holiness, because you've redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people, and you are worthy. And it goes on to say, now this is very important to me, Right on the heels of he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now watch this. He says, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Hallelujah. He said, so I'm talking to people who at one time were not a people, but now are the people of God, which before hadn't obtained mercy, but now you've obtained mercy. I believe that he's talking to Gentiles there because he was saying to them, at one time you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And at one time you hadn't obtained mercy, but now you obtain mercy. So I submit to you that these 24 courses of priesthood are a kingdom of priests made up of both Jew and Gentile believers that are one holy nation who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 
If nothing else, it ought to excite you to be the fact that, that, that you had not obtained mercy before, but now you've obtained mercy. Maybe that's what was causing them to praise. I don't know about you, but when I see the one seated on the throne and the victory that he has won through his redemptive work, who is not going to be king, but he's king right now. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, it'll jerk a praise up out of you. Man, it'll just jerk a praise up out of you. See, to me, this whole kingdom aspect of ruling and reigning is not just, uh, uh, it's not somewhere just way out in the future. It's something that the believer ought to be walking in right now because of the work of what Jesus has done on Calvary's cross. I think, you know, let me see if I can find it very quickly, but I want to look at something uh, here in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, chapter number 2, and, and the Amplified Bible especially it makes it very clear that Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, and he has this dream of a rock cut out of the mountain without hands, and he looks for his diviners to, and his wise men and his soothsayers and all of his, uh, his smart, educated guys to uh, discern what this, uh, uh, this dream he has had is. And so none of them are able to return the answer, but Daniel comes and says there's a, uh, the, the holy God can give to the king the answer. And he tells the king, look, this is what's going to happen actually uh, in the latter days. And he goes on to say, let me see if I can find it very quick, quickly here. Uh, in verse number t- uh, uh, 28, this is Daniel chapter 2 from the, from the Amplified Bible. It says, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, who has made to the king Nebuchadnezzar what is that in the latter days, at the end of days. That's what he's telling. He's given the king a vision of what's going to happen in the biblical last days of the latter days. Now, I submit to you that the latter days are not the last days of this age. They are the latter days or the last days of the old covenant. And you'll see this in the context as we continue to read this. So it's not talking about the last days as in the end of the world, because we think in terms of end of the world like the end of a global situation. But the apostle Paul writes that we are in a world without end. Uh, so uh, when you see the difference between some of these words, sometimes when you see things like in Matthew 24, what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world, it's not end of the world as in the end of a global situation. It's the end of an age as in the end of the age of the law. Paul says this in uh, Corinthians. He says, for uh, all these things that happened to them, happened to them as examples for us upon whom the end of the world has come. Literally, the word there is age. Hebrews 9 also says, once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Again, that word is not global, that word is age. I submit to you that all three of those scriptures that I just quoted are not talking about the end of this age, it was talking about the end of that age. And that's what uh, God is giving this King Nebuchadnezzar a dream about what will take place in the end of the days. He said, as for you, O king... As you were lying upon your bed, thoughts came into your mind about what should come to pass hereafter, and he who reveals secrets was making known to you what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than anyone else living. But in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart and mind. You, O king, saw, and behold, there was a great image. This image, which was mighty and of exceeding great brightness, stood before you, and the appearance of it was frightening and terrible. For as for this image, its head was of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron, partly of clay, the baked clay of the potter. And as you looked, a stone was cut out with out human hands, which smote the image on its feet of iron and baked clay of the potter and broke them to pieces. I submit to you that that is talking about Jesus. If you run the reference, 1 Peter 2, verse 3 through 8, the stone uh, that was rejected was the stone that brought down this image. Then the iron, the baked clay, Jesus was that lively stone. He was the rock cut out of the mountains made without hands. So then the iron, the baked clay of the potter, the bronze, the silver, the gold were broken and crushed together, became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away so that there was not a trace of them could be found. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain or rock and filled the whole earth. I could say it to you like this, you're a chip off of the old block. And what this rock was as it smote the image is ultimately going to fill the earth. As truly as I live, saith God, All the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. I don't believe the devil wins this thing. I believe the authority to see the earth filled with his glory 
is going to come because this rock was cut out of the mountain, but it's also going to become a great mountain, a kingdom, and it's going to fill the whole earth. The kingdom of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of His Christ. He said, You, O king, verse 34, are the, uh, are the king of the earthly kings, to whom God of heaven has given the kingdom, power, might, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, and the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, He has given them into your hand has made you ruler over them all. You king of Babylon are the head of gold. And after you shall arise another kingdom, the meadow Persian, inferior to you, and still a third kingdom of bronze under, uh, under Greece, under Alexander the Great. I love how the Message Bible tells you the digression of these kings. He's saying, you king of Babylon are the head of gold. After you is going to arise another kingdom, which would be the meadow Persian king under Darius the Mede. And then the third one would be Greece under Alexander the Great, which shall bear rule over the earth. And the fourth kingdom which would be Rome, and this is how it translates it in the Amplified Bible. The fourth kingdom, Rome, shall be strong as iron, since iron breaks to pieces, subdues all things, and like the iron which crutches, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, part of baked clay, and part of potter, part, part of iron, it shall be divided kingdom, but there shall be in it of some of the firmness and strength of the iron, just as you saw the iron mixed with miry earth and clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of baked clay of the potter, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle and partly broken. He's talking about the fourth kingdom, which would be the kingdom of Rome, would be partly strong, partly weak. And then he said, You saw the iron mixed with miry and earthy clay, so they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men in marriage bonds, but they will not hold together for two such elements, or ideologies can never harmonize. Even as iron does not mingle itself with clay. And in the days of these final Ten kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall its sovereignty be left to another people, but it shall break and crush and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever, just as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain, and the interpretation of it is sure." Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and paid homage to Daniel. I'm going to stop there. But I want you to be very, very clear about this because this to me is something that's very powerful. We're talking about the king. We're talking about the kingdom. We're talking about a throne with a rainbow. We're talking about one seated on the throne. We're talking about the manifestation of the kingdom here in chapter 4. I submit to you that is the fulfillment of what Daniel chapter 2 was talking about. And he was saying to him here that in the days of these kings... In the days of these ten final kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom will not be left to other people, but it will break in pieces and consume and tear down every other kingdom. And he tells you that the kingdoms and the digression of these kingdoms would be, it would start with Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, then the Medo Persian kingdom under Darius the Mede, then Alexander the Great would come on the scene, and then the Romans would come on the scene. It was during the days of these Roman final ten kings that Jesus comes on the world scene, declares the coming of the kingdom, preaches the kingdom. I believe that he introduces that concept and idea of the kingdom, but I believe the moment that the temple is destroyed in the latter part of the book of Revelation, and God has not only inaugurated His kingdom, but He has consummated His kingdom, that that kingdom is an ever-increasing kingdom of the increase of His government and peace. There shall be no end. What are you saying, Dr. House? I'm trying to tell you we win. I, I, I don't, for the life of me, know why anybody would want to argue with these concepts. What we do with this is we try to hang these ten kings out into some future, uh, like right now, and we try to make this be like, you know, uh, England and, and Iran and, and uh, you know, or whoever we fancifully decide it is. But that was not the context of this. This is not a restored ten-nation federation, nor is it a restored common market nation. Because if you set that in the future, then what you're trying to say is that the kingdom did not come when Jesus, who was the rock cut out of the mountain, came on the scene during the days of these kings, during the days of this particular time, and did establish a kingdom and a priesthood with a people who should be ruling and reigning right now. You say, well, Brother House, don't you look around the world and you see stuff still falling apart and you see things seeming to get worse and worse? Well, first of all, I think the way we look at things has to change. But secondly, if they are getting worse and worse and worse, 
And the truth be known is that there's more people per capita on this planet who are believers and followers of Jesus than there's ever been. The kingdom of God is alive and well on planet Earth. But what would happen? Let me pose this question to you. What would happen if people would begin to embrace and believe what I'm saying? And that is the kingdom came on the scene 2,000 years ago. God established a throne, gave power and dominion to the people of the saints in the Most High. Daniel 7 says a judgment would sit. And that the people of the saints of the Most High God would take the kingdom and possess it. That the time would come when the, king, the saints would possess the kingdom. I'm telling you, he gave the right to rule and reign to these ones seated with him on his throne. I believe that's why we're seated with him in the heavenly places. is because we've been called to rule and reign. What would happen if we would really begin to uh, understand that what has been taught to us, especially by the Word of Faith movement, which I greatly appreciate, has taught the believer authority and dominion. But what if we figure out that this is more than just to get me a new car and a bigger house and money in the bank? And I sure believe in prosperity and all the things that go with it. But this dominion is bigger than just that. This is so that we can triumph over all the works of the enemy. This is so that God can establish His kingdom. What if people would begin to wake up and we begin to operate in the kingdom for such a time as this. I believe what would happen is we would begin to see a trickle down effect where it's not just us crying holy, 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 but as you see in the book of Revelation, it, 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 the living creature cries holy, then the priest cry holy, and the first thing you know, every creature in heaven and earth is crying holy, 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 and they're casting their crowns at his feet, and they're saying, you alone are worthy, you are Lord. Uh, we're out of time. I trust you've been challenged by today's program. Take a moment to call the number on the screen, sow a seed into the ministry. It's what helps us take the gospel of the kingdom around the world. Without you, it's impossible, but with your help, we can continue to do this. It is important that if you're being blessed by it, to become a part of it. Hallelujah. Would you do that today? Call the number on the screen or go to our website. Thanks for joining us. God bless you. For anyone struggling to understand John's writings in Revelation, this book provides true, biblically-based answers. Through detailed insights into the letters John wrote to the seven churches of his day, you will learn how to avoid the mistakes of the early church to overcome today's trials and tribulations. This book will provoke you to thought and dialogue, bringing greater clarity and revelation of Jesus Christ.